Hey, welcome back to Mocktails with Marina. I'm your host, Marina, and today we've got Derek Santiago, a.k.a. Mocktail Wiz, here to discuss so many things under the mocktail non-alc umbrella. I am so excited to dive right in and learn so much more. Thank you so much for being with us today, Derek. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yes. Oh, so many fun things. We're just yeah. going to get started right away. And I would love to start with your personal story to give us some context. So what was the journey like to the creation of Mocktail Wiz in the first place? Yeah, so I get that question a lot. And I can't start talking about Mocktail Wiz without starting from why did I even try to stop drinking in the first place? Um, so I'll, I'll go from there. So grew up in the Philippines, born and raised there. Um, alcohol wasn't really a big part of my life. Um, my mother didn't drink, so we didn't have alcohol growing up. Um, and we didn't have that in the house. Uh, my uncles outside the house, they they were drinking, but it for, for me, it wasn't a, a big thing. Even when I was, uh, because I studied in the Philippines from elementary to high school to, to college. And even in my friend circle and in my school, it wasn't drinky. Um, very different from the high school movies that we were watching from the Western world. <laughs> but <laughs> so it was just not um, a big part of my life. And then in 2013, I had the opportunity to move to the US for a job. It was the same company that I worked for in the Philippines. I do consulting work. I'm a project manager. We implement sales, um, Salesforce uh, that's a customer relationship management application. And so that same job that I had in the Philippines um, brought me to the U.S. And then so that's in 2013. And then that's when I found myself in the middle of happy hours. And, and that's when I kind of tried to understand the, the drinking culture. And, you know, and here happy hours are for me, being a foreigner, it was, I dreaded them because, uh, you know, it's like, oh, I need to speak in English. Uh, and also, um, I didn't get a lot of the cultural references when during small talks. And so I just dreaded them. And then um, I found that when I've had a couple of drinks, it started to relax me and it kind of loosened me up. And so, that's when I kind of trained for happy hours. Um, I remember asking my the, the VP that brought me to the US. Uh, I said, so I was embarrassed the other day. I didn't know what to order. I blurted out champagne. They laughed <laughs> um, because they were like, you know, this is not a wedding. Uh, but then I even asked him, like, what would you say from a wine perspective what would you say should I order just so I have something and that, that's what I always order. And he said, Merlot, oh no, no, Pinot Noir. It, it, uh, he said like with your stature and your build, um, Pinot Noir would be good. But then I graduated to Merlot because I wanted more, you know, a little more oomph to my red wine. But anyway, all that to say that I kind of had to do it because it was part of my job um, because, you know, the job in the U.S. meant I would be more client facing and so more happy hours, more small talk. So since it was part of my job, I kind of trained um, for it and then I got really, really good at it uh, at and drinking and now I'm retired. Uh, but but that's when the drinking started to have a more significant part in my life, given that I feel like I needed it for my job. Um, but I was a good uh, drink moderator. Um, I, I always, is that how you say it? I moderated my drinking. I always <laughs> fumble when I say that. Like I tried to moderate my drinking and I think I was successful in doing that um, until I lost my mom in 2020. And suddenly the moderation was hard and I kind of used it to numb the grief and to escape hard feelings that I didn't want to feel. And I did that for a couple of years until um, in 2022, I decided to question my relationship with alcohol because I just wasn't feeling good anymore. Um, I felt like I was slow um, when it comes to my job. Um, I didn't have any wreckage. So that was actually kind of part of the problem because I thought you have to have wreckage in order to have a problem. And so since I don't have wreckage, therefore I don't have a problem, which kind of held me back for a little bit. 
Um, but yeah, it, I listened to the book, This Naked Mind in 2022, and that that approach somehow stuck with me. And then I tried to go back to moderation. And in my effort to go back to moderation, I decided I need to have a break first, like a long break without alcohol. And then maybe we'll get back to moderation. So during that break is when I created my first mocktail, um, which was a spicy pineapple margarita using. And it's funny because I just needed something while I was meal prepping that weekend. And I didn't have any spirit alternatives, what have you. So I just uh, muddled some jalapeno. Uh, I had pineapple juice. I had tahini. And I remember I didn't even have fresh lime juice, but I had those lime packets, the powdered ones. I'm like, this will work. Um, and it did, it worked. Um, and it kind of scratched the itch. And and so I thought, oh, okay, I think I'll be good. Um, I'll have something fun to drink while I'm meal prepping. Maybe maybe I'll be okay. Um, and so I started doing that just privately, you know, not posting anything until July of 2022 is when I created, oh, I posted my first reel. Um, I was just curious because I'm an elder millennial and I see these kids doing videos on Instagram and I'm like, I'm going to try that out. And so I did and it got attention. Um, and then I tried it again. I posted something again and it again got attention. And I thought, oh, there's some interest here. I'll create a separate account um, dedicated to mocktails because at that point, I've I've had maybe a month of no alcohol. So the creativity is back. You know, it was overflowing. I couldn't sleep <laughs> because I had a lot of recipe ideas. Um, so I'm like, I just needed an outlet for this newfound or my, like I, I refound, is that a word? I refound the creativity yeah. um, and I needed an outlet. Um, and so that's when Mocktail Wiz, um got started and so and then a lot of things happen and now here we are so that's Yay! like the crash course <laughs> quick background on how I got here that's such a cool story because there's it just there's so many inspiring things about what you just said first off I want to begin by saying thank you so much for sharing this story I know it's so personal and I know people ask you all the time especially because you're on a book tour you made <laughs> a really cool book which we'll talk I about in a book. second yes but I also want to mention here that like it's I can tell like the moment I came across your profile for the first time like it felt like something so deeply personal like clearly you also have this talent of photography and videography in general as well beyond yeah. just the mocktails right like this you're the full package when it comes to creating all of this content and but beyond that there was like this extra element of love that like now it's so obvious to me that like it's it feels like a tribute to your mom. Like it just it feels is. like like I can feel the love in what you do and how you communicate. And, you know, as you know, you've been on other podcasts, too, like you've done these other things. And every time I've interacted with any of your media, I feel the same thing, which is, I think, incredibly important in this industry because so many people, you know, are sober, sober curious. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a sensitive topic for a lot of people that I feel like back in the day was a lot more taboo than it yeah. is nowadays. So it's, it's this beautiful icebreaker moment that you have. So that being said, let's talk about your book. It's so yeah. beautiful. Tell us about it. Thank you. Um, I just got lucky. Uh, well, <laughs> luck and also a lot of hard work, like you mentioned, um, uh, when I started my mocktail with Instagram, I was just using my phone um, and, you know, just focusing on the recipe. But the more distance I had from alcohol, the creativity started coming back. So I started picking up old hobbies. And I've heard this so many times for people who stop drinking um, because suddenly you have a lot of time, right? So because you don't numb yourself out during the night anymore. So this is when I started picking up old hobbies. Photography is one of them. So in the beginning, I was just using my phone to take videos. And then uh, later on, I picked up my old camera, mirrorless camera to take photos. And then learned how to convert my photography skills to videography and started really um, becoming passionate about the presentation of the drinks. And so I was just doing that. And 
Um, and I tell this, I, I mentioned this in my Instagram before, like I kept doing that and I was doing that for me because I was just looking for an outlet, regardless if who sees my video or like it, even if it wasn't being shown to people, which, you know, if you're a content creator who, who are wanting to start this, you know, it's not like not everybody will be an overnight success. Like some of us have had a couple of years without any visibility, but I just kept going because I felt passionate about this creativity and also of what I was doing, which was providing options for fun drinks to drink when you're not drinking alcohol. And so I was just doing this on the side, you know, not even a what's the lowest type of influencer, nano influencer. I wasn't even like a thousand followers at the time, but somehow uh, an, uh, a Simon & Schuster imprint, um, Adams Media, they contacted me via email and um, they asked if I wanted to do a, a mocktail book for them. And I didn't know who Simon & Schuster was because <laughs> I was born and raised in the Philippines and you know, I, I don't really read non, non-tech non books. <laughs> so I wasn't familiar with them. Um, my partner, I called him because I'm like, hey, I got this email. I'm kind of shaking right now. It says Simon & Schuster. Do you know these guys? And he's like, yeah, only top five publishing house <laughs> worldwide. So that seems legit. So yeah, so I got lucky that they, even though I didn't have a big following at the time, they somehow found my my Instagram page and my website and they liked how I, my approach on mocktails. And so they reached out and we had a conversation and, and yeah. And then we decided, yes, we're going to do this. Um, we talked about the vibe of the book, um, the format, and it was just a perfect match. And so, so yeah, another benefit of sobriety is the ability to say yes when opportunity comes because I was so, you know, just, I didn't have any distractions. So, so I was able to say yes. And, and boy, I'm so happy I did because it like, it's everything that I imagined and more. Aww. It's a special book. For those of you who are unfamiliar, you can check the description of this episode to get the link. Um, but it is called The Mocktail Club, Classic Recipes, and new favorites without the booze. Mm -hmm. I saw it the other day when I was at Barnes & Noble and I went yeah. to another Barnes & Noble and it was there too. It was so exciting. Yeah. You can get it anywhere. You can get it online and in the yeah. stores. But I want to also touch on the fact that I saw you doing a little traveling with the books. You've been doing a little bit of presenting to people. How's that been going? That was That's unexpected. Like I wasn't, um, I wasn't expecting it, but it's it's made me so happy uh, to be able to do that because I feel like, um, so the, the, book, the book, The Mocktail Club, um, our goal is to let people know that you can have complex drinks, uh, even without the booze, uh, that you can still have fun and be part of the ritual. Uh, because a lot of us feel left out uh, when we have gatherings and people, everybody else drinking and then we're not. So that's the goal is to make to make it known to people that you can still have fun drinks. And also it it doesn't have to be very complicated. So I made sure that the book, um, the ingredients are easy to find and that the techniques are easy to follow. So that's the main goal of the book. Um, and then I had the opportunity. Again, I, I feel like I've just been so lucky. Um, OC Public Libraries, I'm based in Orange County, California. And OC Public Libraries reached out to me to... Um, to ask if I wanted to do a mocktail demo in one of the libraries. And and so I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? <laughs> uh, it's going to be like an hour, 30 minute author talk and then sampling of the drinks. And like I mentioned in the beginning of our, of our podcast, I can't tell the story about how the book came about without talking about my personal story and how, you know, the journey from... Um, you know, fully drinking to being sober curious to now being sober serious. And so I always share about that because um, when I was trying to stop drinking, I didn't see a lot of people like that. Um, it was maybe because I wasn't looking for those people, but I thought it was going to be black or white. Like it's either you have a problem 
or your normal in terms of drinking. And so I've used the opportunities that have been given to me by OC Public Libraries to talk to the general public, like um, not just about the book, but that, hey, you don't have to have a problem to stop drinking. Like you don't have to have a rock bottom um, to say that you you have a problem and then you should stop. You can just, you know, stop for tonight, stop for a weekend or for a month. And so I think that's the most fulfilling part of the talks is not just talking about the the book and how to make these drinks, but more about um, being mindful and questioning our relationship with alcohol. And I've had a lot of good response and people not knowing about this this world, the, the non-alcoholic world. Like they didn't even know that spirit alternatives existed. They thought mocktails are just juices. And so being able to speak about that and be the representative of the, you know, non-alc uh, mocktail world of Instagram has been truly a blessing. And I've, I've spoken at um, two libraries and then I've been invited to speak in, in events too. So I'm so thankful. I didn't expect any of that to happen. <laughs> I thought when the book come, came out that that was it. But um, yeah, sobri another gift of sobriety. Just uh, like I mentioned, saying yes, being able to say yes to opportunities when they come. Hmm. I love that you mentioned the fact that sobriety is not black and white because in my experience of speaking with people behind the bar or you know, even business owner to business owner, a lot of people have a hard time sharing their story no matter what, right? Because mm -hmm. there's there's always a lot mm -hmm. of feelings involved. And then, you know, especially when you hear someone else's story, you know, it's it's natural to want to be really supportive and it can be really difficult to breach some of these conversations. But having a beautiful mocktail to start the conversation, mm -hmm. I think it's just it's the coolest way to enter enter the chat. And yeah. that being said, there's so much there's so many levels of commu uh, consumer education that still needs to be had in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. on, on one hand, of course, we have the fact that, you know, sobriety is not black and white. Very important place to start. Number mm -hmm. two, there are, you know, I want to start with functionality of mocktails, right? And what I mean with function specifically is some mocktails actually make you feel something. And then some mocktails are purely for the fun of the flavor in your mouth. Yes. So I'm curious, you know, when it kind of came to creating your book, what did you, like as you were putting all the different recipes together, you know, did you were you thinking about the different functions? Were you different thinking about the different kinds of people? Like what was that like artistic process like mm -hmm. to create all of those recipes and kind of make a story through them all? Yeah, to me, my main focus is I wanted the drinks to be complex uh, and to be able to stand in for real cocktails or not real cocktails, but alcoholic cocktails. Let's just call it that because mocktails are real drinks too. Um, but that was my main focus is to make it complex because I didn't want, I wanted to redefine mocktails as to, because it's been, it's, it's had a bad rap of being just combination of juices. So I was trying to change that by introducing ingredients that are simple um, that can really make your drink complex so you don't just guzzle it down like juice. Um, so that was my main, main um, goal when creating the recipes. And then I started looking into some health benefits too, because like removing the alcohol all already makes your drink healthy <laughs> because you, you don't have the ethanol there anymore. Why don't we, you know, take it up a notch and, and add um, ingredients that are healthy? My favorite thing to use was uh, is ginger shots. Mm. Um, so I even have a recipe of how to make ginger shots in the book because I just add ginger shot. It adds heat. Um, it has anti-inflammatory properties and just you know, very well known as a healthy uh, ingredient, especially where I come from in Asia. Um, so I have that ginger shots there. Um, I've used uh, oversteeped tea as base for some of the drinks. So, so I I wanted complex drinks, drinks that would have um, health benefits, uh, and also drinks that would look beautiful because, you know. Um, 
we we still like to be part of a ritual. So if you have friends over and you're having drinks, you know, you want to feel like you belong. So having nice looking drinks uh, with the right glasses and garnishes, I think helps make you feel part of that ritual. So that's kind of like what I was um, uh, envisioning when I was imagining the recipes. Uh, I also have added... Um, some recipes that kind of represent flavors from where I come from, the Philippines. So I have calamansi there, uh, uh, which is a very tart, kind of younger brother of a lemon. It's very small, but very potent. Um, I have a lychee martini there. So some some representative of flavors from where I come from, because I kind of want to introduce that as part of the book, like, hey, I'm Filipino. <laughs> so I uh, th these are flavors I grew up with. Um, and then some of the drinks, uh, what just one of them, I made sure, uh, well, I didn't make sure, one of them I created for my mother, because really the book is in honor of her. Um, and so it was important to me to create a drink um, that's dedicated to her. And so um, if you have the book, it's called The Citrus Rose Martini. Um, it's inspired by <laughs> this drink that, so my mom didn't drink. But there was just one time uh, that I remember when I was young that our neighbors invited her us over for for a party. And in the Philippines, there's this um, cocktail called gin palm, which is short for gin pomelo. And it's nothing fancy. It's literally gin, water, and pomelo juice powder. <laughs> so, you know, it's very, it's like, it was very popular. So I made an elevated version of that, added some floral notes to it because my mother loved flowers. And so I added rose syrup um, and then it's garnished with a small rose. So to me, it's just something that's specifically for my mom and because the book wouldn't be here if not for her, her influence and also the journey because of me trying to cope um, with the grief of her loss. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that you put your heart and soul into all of the drinks you make. And I also love that you're using ingredients that aren't necessarily well known, especially to the American palate. When I was in college, I worked at a tea bar, which was it was this mm -hmm. wild concept in Madison, Wisconsin. It was a bubble tea shop. But oh, that yeah. basically was open until 1, 2 a.m., just as like an alternative on the mm -hmm. college campus. And I was not sober at the time. I just worked there. And I didn't even know too much about tea until I'd started working there. And then I got to use so many different ingredients that I wasn't used to. Lychee was definitely one of my favorites. But I yeah. also noticed on your feed very recently, you made, um, it was an ube colada. Yeah. <laughs> Love ube. Yeah. I would love to just take a moment to <laughs> shout this ingredient out. Can you please tell us a little bit about it and tell people why it's so pretty? Yeah. So ube is a root crop native in Southeast Asia. Um, I would say this is the, the national dessert flavor in the Philippines. So it's a it's a root. Um, it's very purple. Uh, we use we usually make jams. Um, so ube jam. Um, and then just in general, ube flavor is popular in the Philippines. So we have ube ice cream, ube jam, like ube bread and all sorts of things. I was recently in Hawaii um, for a quick vacation and on the menu was an ube colada. And so I was like, oh my gosh, um, I need to try that because I have never thought of mixing ube and pineapple Um <laughs> In the Philippines, we actually combine ube and cheese, which is a weird combo, but don't knock it till you try it. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so I was insp inspired by that ube colada. And so uh, I had it and, you know, it was good. It wasn't really a mocktail. It was more of a virgin version of a drink. And so I just created my own recipe uh, using a non-alcoholic rum, which really adds some depth to it. And it was delicious. And so, so yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of that recipe. 
yeah, it's beautiful. It is the perfect shade of purple. And I can't wait to, I definitely jotted that recipe down. I cannot wait to give it a try. Mm. I always used to mix ube flavor with like vanilla, things that would make yes. it kind of be more like a cookie, like yeah. or like a cake. But now that I'm, I'm like upset, I've never tried it with cheese because it makes sense. It's like a potato. Like, yeah, it, yeah, it we, would be amazing. We have ice cream that's flavored ube and cheese because it's like, mm. you know, ube has um, flavors of vanilla, uh, a little nutty, like a little. Mm -hmm. that, that's why it goes well with coconut, too. And then ice cream form, it's sweet. And so the cheese cuts the sweetness with its saltiness. So it, it sounds weird to have a vanilla, uh, like a ube cheese ice cream but it's it's good but yeah ube goes really well with rum too because of the you know the non-alcoholic rums that we have in the market they have flavors of molasses vanilla so that goes really well with ube in the ube colada recipe i created my own ube simple syrup um, which is just half cup of sugar half cup of water and then a teaspoon of ube extract and then you can use that for you know whatever other mocktail recipes that you want to try. Mm. Usually on the market, I feel like there's a lot of like powder and then the powder has like um, oh, that milk derivative in it, which means a lot of people can't consume it. So mm. thank you for giving us this simple syrup <laughs> recipe to make it much easier to blend yeah. with so many different uh, recipes here. So this leads me to my next question about like value of mocktail. This is a hot topic I keep seeing and I am I'm bored of this conversation, but that's why I want to put it to rest with you right now. Uh -huh. A lot of people I keep seeing this who don't know much about mocktails. They don't understand why mocktails can be the same price as a cocktail yeah. because a lot of people tend to value the alcohol. Um, but in your opinion, you know, do you feel like mocktails are similar in value in terms of the price? Yeah, and, and I would argue that if they're using non-alcoholic alternatives, it should even be more expensive than alcohol because the misconception is that the alcohol is the expensive ingredient in your drink. That is incorrect. Um, you can have like a $10 bottle of gin, um, you know, because alcohol has been around for a thousand of, over a thousand of years and it's not expensive. Um the the value of mocktails, well, good ones. We're not talking about just virgin versions of your drinks, but real mocktails that, you know, we put the same care and attention to detail in crafting mocktails, like like the ones that I make. And, you know, just the, the creativity in terms of ingredients. Um, and then you're you also don't have alcohol to hide behind, you know, like it's it's very common. You go to like a dive bar, regardless of the taste of the drink, put more alcohol. People will love it. Uh, but with mocktails, you don't have that. And so you're just stuck with flavor, texture um, and the overall experience. And so to me, if if a mocktail uses creative ingredients, it could be oversteep tea or like aloe juice or something that's unusual. And and if it's obvious that they put care and you know a lot of thought into the drink, I would pay good money for for that mocktail. But yeah, the main misconception is that alcohol is the expensive part. So remove alcohol; it should be inexpensive. But that's just not correct. It's true. And, you know, the more brands come out, the more I'm seeing people being more aware of like, okay, we came out with our first formula, but how can we make it even better? So yeah. it's not, I'm not seeing people in this industry, you know, fall victim to the commercialization process. Oh, how can we make more of this cheaper? I'm not seeing a lot of that. The few times that I have seen it, they in, those options instantly become appearing, not yeah. everybody's favorite anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think this is a really important point. And it brings me to my next question, which is, you know, brands love to work with you, whether uh, you're making content or, you know, mm. as you are creating the book, you have a recipe deck. I'm curious. I would just love to know what is it like to collaborate with you? Like, tell me about the process of let's say I'm a brand and I'm like, hey, Derek, I have this thing. I'd love you to do your magic. Tell me, yeah. tell me how that works. Yeah. So I actually love working with small businesses. That's another thing about 
you know, that I, I would just like to touch on this before we, we talk about uh, working with me. Um, in terms of the value of mocktails, a lot of the non-alcoholic spirit brands are mom and pop shops or like, you know, small businesses. They're not backed up by big corporations. And so they do their own R&D and that's very expensive. So a lot of the spirit alternatives that we have in the market, and it's fairly new invention, right? They, they've only been around for like, I don't know, a decade or so. So it's still very new to the industry. And so with that, it, there's not a lot of competition. So, you know, it will be expensive. Um, and so if, if a mocktail uses the spirit alternative, I will pay good money uh, for that mocktail. Now to that point, um, I have the pleasure of working with a lot of small businesses, you know, they just launched an RTD or they just launched a new spirit alternative. And I feel like, because I do have a day job. So my my mocktail business is more of a side gig. And and given that I've had this opportunity to be given this platform, I want to use it to help uplift small businesses. And so when a small business reaches out to me, um, what I usually do is, uh, because it's very common for content creators to receive gifted products and then, um, you know, you create content for the gifted product. I personally... Um, would offer just to make content for free in exchange of the product. Um, and then if I if I like it um, and can vouch for it, then I will create content for it and then promote it on my page. And also that gives the, the business um, kind of like a preview of what I can do. And it gives them a sense of my, like what I deliver. Like you mentioned, um, I'm very passionate about presentation. So I take a lot of care and um, I spend a lot of time making sure that the videos look great because that's what catches the attention of the people, right? That's what makes them stop scrolling and and look at, hey, what's what's this product? So that's how I work. Um, usually I get approached by brands and then, you know, if I've already been using their product, I still do give like a, a free um, piece of content just as a thing because and I, I was telling my partner this the other day like for a lot of these small brands that bottle that they sent to you that's their dream you know it takes a lot of effort and time and commitment to come up with a product and I recognize that so when a brand reaches out to me hey we want to send you this I treasure it because, you know, it could be like, that could be me in the future when I come out with, uh, with my own thing, you know, who knows? But to me, I recognize that a lot of these small brands, their product, that's a product of their dream. And so I try to do justice and give them a little something as a preview. And then if they want to work with me and they like my approach, then we can talk about, you know, um, UGC, um, setup later on, but, that's just how I work. And and I do recognize that that's coming from a kind of like a privileged standpoint in that this is not my my main source of income. It's kind of like a, a side gig. That's why I was able, I'm able to do that. And and I want to do it because I want this industry to to thrive. And I feel like in my small way, I'm contributing to making this cute little industry that's really booming this time. <laughs> um you know to to stay mm. i think it's really cool that you focus so much on that aligning moment before diving into anything business related you know because this is the thing that i have i've seen with a lot of our clients here at the modern mocktail and in general you know there's a lot of people who are excited they're excited to be in the industry and they want to do all these things but you know sometimes it 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 it's important to make sure that it makes sense for everybody. Yep. And, and that's a process. It's just like getting to know someone, right? Mm -hmm. Just as a mm -hmm. person. And, but instead you're getting to know the spirit of whatever yeah. was sent to you. And, and every little thing is like, every little ingredient is a love letter, right? And that once you get to open it, like, it's like you're meeting someone new. So yeah. I love, I love that romanticizing of that process instead of, you know, a lot of people are like, how do you automate and scale your business and do all these things? And it's like, but then we're missing the heart and, yeah, and exactly. the, the reason we're doing all the things. So I think that's so beautiful. <laughs> My next question for you is 
very specifically about the word mocktail. Now, mm-hmm. you and I obviously love the word mocktail. It's in both of our handles. Yeah. You know, in general, you know, at least in in my opinion, I feel like a lot of times like cultures come up with more and more words to describe something that becomes really important to them. But for example, like, you know, a Nordic country isn't going to have a million desert words because there's no hot deserts there. And, And the same thing goes for, I feel, the mocktail industry in general. So at first, you know, mocktail was the word that we all knew and love. And it's mm-hmm. it's an old word that we all like, no matter where you're coming from, yes. you know, you can recognize it. But there's a lot of people who are trying to specialize or, you know, whatever their marketing thing is. So yes. I'm just curious, you know, I know we love the word mocktail, but how yeah. do you feel about all the other words? And like, how do you feel about mocktail? So that's a great question. And I actually wrote about this in the beginning of my book. Um, so mocktail, by definition, is just a cocktail without the alcohol. So it's like a, to me, it's a blanket st- blanket word that you can use for, you know, when I call it non-alcoholic cocktail, zero-proof cocktail. Those are mocktails because by definition, it's just cocktail without the booze. Um I did my research when I started my account and I just found, I just found that Mocktail is the most familiar name, um, regardless of where you are in, whether you're in a sobriety journey or not, mocktails are, the, the word mocktail just resonates and people are familiar with it. And so to me, that provided me with like a, like a, a better reach to people because, um, you know, where I come from, they know what mocktails are. Um, I'd been to India and mocktails are very popular there. And, you know, so in other parts of the world, mo- the word mocktail is not controversial. I think I think th- that's only controversial here in the U.S. because, you know, and we understand people want to differentiate themselves um, because, like I said, the word mocktail has had a bad rap of being just combination of juices and they want to separate themselves from that. And I, I do understand that. And so... To me, I don't care what you call it. I personally think that mocktails, the word mocktail is the most familiar word um, for people who don't drink and people who drink or people who don't care about drinking. Uh, I feel like it's it's the most universal uh, term. Um, my only call to action and my only plea is that if you are going to use other words as an alternative to the word mocktail, make sure that you know what you're talking about um, because there are differences. So I'm seeing people use the words zero proof, um, alcohol free, non-alcoholic, de-alcoholized, like all these different terms have different meanings. And, And in some countries, the meanings could differ. For instance, in the U.S., um, you can call your drink non-alcoholic if it has less than 0.5% alcohol. Um, in other parts of the world, um, you know, the alcohol-free term, that's the one that's kind of, that kind of varies. In the U.S., it has to be 0.00% to be called alcohol-free legally. But I know in the U.K., it can be It can have a whisper, like 0.05%, I think, Mm -hmm. can still be called alcohol-free. And um, zero proof is equal to alcohol-free to me. So to me, it's like just knowing the difference of these terms before you call it, because it may not matter to you, like that 0.5% may not matter to you, but to some people, especially people in recovery, like... I, I know a lot of, I have friends in recovery that would not touch anything with 0.5%. And I, I just think we need to be respectful of that. And therefore we need to be careful when using terms like zero proof, alcohol-free, non-alcoholic. Um, and yeah, that so that's my hot take, I would say, <laughs> with that controversial topic. Mm, so important. So important. I remember the first time I tried uh a beer that I thought was alcohol free, but it was actually non-alc. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, my sobriety story is not like so severe that that like caused a mental breakdown in any way for me, but Mm -hmm. it did cause like, like I was, I was definitely in my feels a little bit because like I, I live in the desert and out here, like 
you get hung over before you even get drunk kind of a thing because you get dehydrated. <laughs> yeah. So to me, like I'm actually really sensitive nowadays. Back in the day when I was in college, I could put so much down and it would be fine. I could still walk. But nowadays, yeah. like literally I felt it and I was shocked. Like, again, I went to college in Wisconsin, like one of the most drunk states in the United States. <laughs> I was amazed with how much it had actually affected me. So I'm really glad that you mentioned the difference between those. So mm -hmm. I have two more questions yeah. for you. The first one is my favorite one to ask everybody who comes on the podcast, which is this. If you could wave a magic wand and change anything about the non-elk industry, and by change, I mean it could be a new invention or maybe just, you know, let's fix this little thing, um, what would it be and why? Um, the first thing that came to mind is the red wine category, um, <laughs> because I think uh, red wine is very hard to mimic as a non-alcoholic version of a red wine because a lot of, either, you know, it's it's flat, not like sparkling wine. You have texture to hide behind. Um, and so my my magic wand, I, I guess I'll use it to have like a very good red wine. I do miss it. Um, I have found some favorites that are, you know, close enough um, in terms of the taste and and texture, but um, I haven't found like a red wine, a non-alcoholic red wine that made me think, oh, this tastes just like the real thing. I'm still kind of hoping and wishing for that. Um, I've, I've heard murmurs that there's already a brand that kind of is getting very close. I haven't tried it yet. Um, but yeah, I would use that, I think, as that's the first thing that that came to mind Um when you when you ask about the magic wand, but now that I've had a little bit of time to think about it, um, I would I would hope another if I have a second wave at the wand, I I hope that there would be more options and it be and it stays like that in restaurants because that's when most people need something to drink that's non alcoholic when people when other people are already drinking you know you want to feel included or you you want to dodge questions about why you're not drinking and at least in my area there are restaurants that have options that are good options for non-alcoholic um drinks but i don't think we're quite there yet um i was in hawaii for like i mentioned and it was a very drinky town or island and wasn't a lot of um, non-alcoholic options except for the virgin versions of the drink. Um, so I guess I would use my second wand wave um, to kind of correct that, to have options. Um, same with like gluten-free diet, right? Or ve vegetarian and vegan diet. Like maybe years ago, we didn't have a lot of options. But when you go to restaurants now, you have options, at least one or two for all different dietary restrictions and hopefully it would be the same with with mocktails and alcohol too. Mm, I love that. And I agree with you. When I was in Hawaii with my husband earlier this year, we just wanted to find a nice little beach set up to where we could just sit and drink mm -hmm. a nice little drink. And we had we'd hopped around a little bit and then we even went to the Hilton and we were like, you know what? Normally they have a big bar if you were yeah. into that. So they've got to have something. And you know, they had great garnishes in terms of like the most beautiful flowers, yeah, but yeah. the closest I could get was something with a bunch of ginger beer in it, which I'm a big fan of ginger. I need it in everything, but that was like the most functional thing they had. Yeah. And it was, it honestly was more of a spritzer. So I am, yeah. I am all aboard with, <laughs> with all of your magic wand wavings. <laughs> Love it. All right. So tell us what's next, Derek. What do you have going on in Mocktail Whiz World? So at Mocktail Wiz, um, I have a, um, I'm partnering with a local um, restaurant, and not local because I'm in Orange County, they're in Alhambra. Um, they're called Free Spirited Lounge. Um, they're a small business and they're doing uh, like a, a, a spirit-free lounge where you can have complex drinks. And I'm partnering with them. Uh, we're going to do a mixology class um, that's coming up towards the end of this month. So I'm excited about that. Um, but yeah, just continuing educating, I guess, and, and grabbing every chance I get to be able to speak about 
sober curiosity. Like you mentioned earlier, there's different ways to enter the chat. And the way I enter the chat is not like, oh, you have to stop drinking. Um, the way I enter the chat is, you know, you can be curious about the alcohol-free lifestyle. It doesn't have to be boring. You can still have nice drinks. Um, but it's always a good idea to take a break, whether it's a day, a weekend, or, you know, a month. Um from drinking alcohol, always a good thing. Um, so grabbing every chance I get to speak about that because I think awareness um, and, and knowing that there are fun drinks to drink when you're not drinking, that just planting that seed uh, when you want to take a break, I think that's important to know that these things exist. So continue to do that via my Instagram. Uh, I'm doing a Filipino flavor series there in the spirit of, you know, promoting flavors that I grew up with. So I'm excited about that. Um, yeah. And I had a second um, work, uh, make it a mocktail recipe deck that just came out um, in July. And so, you know, promoting that also together with the mocktail club, my first book. Uh, yeah. So lots of, lots of good things I had. Ah, so many fun things. Yeah. Oh, I, I think that the mocktail recipe deck idea is absolutely brilliant. And I literally, like, I'm just thinking, like, how cool that can be over time, too. You know, like, you have not only the ones that you've already created, but, like, as these new options come up and then you got to educate us and tell us how to make them taste good, yeah. then we get all these new additions of the deck. I can't exactly. wait to collect them all like Pokemon cards. <laughs> yeah. Them all. yeah, thank you. appreciate that. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to share with us today, Derek? Just thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure meeting you and, and chatting with you. And yeah, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, everybody, for listening. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas, anything at all that came up from this and you'd like to speak with myself or Derek, just go ahead and send an email to hello at marinamars.com and we'll make sure to get that answered for you. Again, you can go ahead and take a look at the description to see how you can get a copy of the book, the recipe deck, how you can follow Derek on Instagram, Mocktail Wiz. And like I mentioned... If you need anything else at all, just let us know. Thank you so much for being here with us today.